Welcome to Renewable Energies, live from Jena. Happy New Year, first of all. Well, I hope that you are doing well in this crisis, which uh, got more serious in the past few weeks. I'm sure that this year will be difficult, but it will, I'm also sure that it will get better. It's unfortunate uh, that I still have to teach here in this empty classroom, but nevertheless, uh, we should do it. Um, you might wonder why I, am, uh, I have still here my Christmas tree, and actually I choked a little bit about that uh, yesterday in my class on nonlinear optics. Some of you may attend uh, that class also. And uh, afterwards I thought, well, I should uh, perhaps do my research. So what I was joking about was that people are throwing out their Christmas trees, in my opinion, too early. Um, so I think that they should be thrown out not before the 5th or the 6th of, uh, of December. And therefore, this one uh, still is here. By the way, I decorated it with my FFP2 mask. I hope you find it pretty. Uh, anyway, um, well, so I did my research and I asked uh, the all-knowing Wikipedia. And it turned out, ah, well, I didn't show what I wanted to show actually, namely, namely, namely this sad picture here. Um, and as I said, I asked the all-knowing Wikipedia and I was quite surprised that on the English Wikipedia, there's, uh, there's quite an extensive article. I just uh, show here uh, a, small, uh, a small part of it. And uh, indeed, it says yeah, that we should keep it uh, at least till, till the 12th night. And uh, well, I can say a few words about the 12th night uh, afterwards. Uh, or candle mass, so 12th night. Uh, 25 plus uh, plus uh, 12. This is about five. Uh, you know, uh, in Christianity they count sometimes a little bit uh, in a strange way, right? So um, they count the first day and the and the last day uh, separately. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. And it says that it shouldn't be removed before the the fifth or sixth. And actually, if you take it really serious, then you keep some decoration until Candlemas, which is 40 days after Christmas. Okay, so um, I hope this is now clear. Um, a few words to, um, to 12 days. This is actually a famous English um, Christmas carol. And uh, it sings about uh, a present every day of these 12 days, right? And how could you throw out your Christmas tree before? Uh, I learned about this uh, from this um, CD, from this uh, music here. Um, and you see here, well, strange instruments. In our Christmas lecture, we, uh, I also showed this. Yeah, the, it's called a cornet, or in German, zinc. Um, and these are historic trombones, as we also showed them uh, in our Christmas lecture. Okay, so far, uh, so enough for, for the less serious uh, part here. Let me come to what we discussed in the last lecture. We were talking about the wind, not so much on the things that we talked uh, a few lectures ago, namely um, that we were talking about how wind is uh, created in the atmosphere. So we treated the atmosphere as a heat engine. But now we are more interested on the properties of the wind. After all, uh, in the end, when you are planning a, a wind power plant, um, then uh, you want to have some predictions on how big the yield would be. And uh, this is more, um, and other things, by the way. So like what you have to expect on, on load, yes, such that you construct your windmill such that it 
that it's not broken if the wind is stronger and so on and so forth, right? And uh, the first thing that we looked at um, was uh, geostrophic wind. So this is wind in uh, bigger heights, so on a scale of 1,000 kilometers, roughly plus minus, right? Um, and this is, of course, again, not the wind that is directly interesting for us because uh, we are interested in the wind that's closer to the surface, of course, because a windmill um, has a height of, well, perhaps 250 meters if you take a very big um, windmill, um, actually. But this would actually be not the height of the rotor, but the height of the, um, of the tip um, when it's at its utmost uh, position. So um, the geostrophic wind um, will be decelerated, so there's friction, of course, due to the surface of, uh, of the Earth, and um, this gives rise to a special wind profile that we are going to calculate uh, today. It's a logarithmic uh, wind profile. Um, but before we do this, um, we can have a look at some other local types of wind, namely sea land breeze and mountain valley breeze. And you probably know this from school, I guess. At least I learned it at school some when sixth, seventh grade or something like that. Right, so um, on daytime, if it is um, land heats up and therefore you have rising air here, so this will produce a low pressure area, a, low, a local low uh, pressure area. And of course, uh, in the sea you have uh, the opposite and therefore kind of a miniature Hadley cell develops, right? And uh, this gives a fairly stable breeze from the sea. And uh, during the night, uh, the opposite, just a little bit weaker, develops because water doesn't cool as quickly as land, and therefore the opposite thing um, happens. Similarly for mountain valleys, um, there, um, heat uh, or, um, yeah, so uh, the valley is, is heated up and um, so this kind of circulation uh, can develop and in the night um, pretty much the, op um, the opposite. Um, but now in, in, um, in the mountains you can have an additional effect, namely that, um, that there is a slope um, of the entire valley, yeah, so that um, and this then can lead to very, very strong winds. Um, so um, amplified by nozzle-like um, effects. So wind speeds of 250 kilometers per hour I read about. Yeah, so quite impressive natural phenomena. Okay, so this is um, these few remarks on the um, um, sea land breeze and mountain valley breeze. And now we come to the logarithmic wind profile. And this was derived by Ludwig Brandl, one of the um, big pioneers in fluid mechanics. Um, I introduced him already uh, at the very beginning of this lecture when I alluded to his book, um, which is still being printed, uh, of course updated, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, probably in the 15th, 16th or so, so edition. Um, well, he was, uh, he derived uh, the logarithmic wind profile that we are going to, to derive um, in a simplified version. Um, but he was, also, um, he was also one of the main driving forces in the pioneering days of fluid mechanics. Um, so fluid mechanics was um, of particular interest in the beginning of the last century, of the 20th century, uh, with aeronautics, of course. And um, so uh, he was instrumental in forming um, uh, many of these institutes in Germany, uh, all of them, or most of them, um, yeah, uh, most of them uh, located in Göttingen. Um, and uh, so there was the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, uh, for example, that uh, was transformed later in the Max Planck Institute um, of Fluid Mechanics. And um, well, um, later on, so um, 
it was transformed into, so its direction was, uh, was changed. Uh, because, of course, uh, wind profiles as shown here, so these are the so-called Göttingen wind pro um, um, airfoil profiles, yeah, Tragflächenprofile. Um, so uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, research was done in Göttingen in his institute. And uh, next lecture, I guess, uh, we'll also s um, learn to know uh, Betz, uh, who was the successor of, uh, of Ludwig Brandl and who developed the, uh, the science of, um, 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 of wind power plants. Okay, so with these remarks, let's try to de uh, derive, um, let's try to derive the logarithmic wind profile. So I wrote down already the headline and uh, what you would do in principle uh, would be to start with the, um, with the Reynolds averaged Nav Navier-Stokes uh, equations. And um, well, we won't deal with the Navier-Stokes uh, equations, but um, the idea of this Reynolds averaged Reynolds-Stokes equation, this we kind of use, namely what, um, uh, what Reynolds did was to, um, to say, well, I uh, consider the, um, the wind profile, um, so the vector field of the, of the wind. So I assume that there is a dominating velocity and all this turbulence and so on. Um, this, um, this I kind of, um, of separate from, uh, from that, such uh, that one has an averaged velocity plus um, all these fluctuations. So let's write that down. So this idea, so the um, Reynolds averaging. So and what he did, uh, what he did was, um, so Reynolds, made the ansatz that the wind speed u as a function of r and t is given by the averaged, so these are these uh, square brackets here. Um, so it's given by, by this um, averaged speed plus all the fluctuations. Right? And with this, uh, yeah, so substituting this into the Navier-Stokes equation, he arrived at the Reynolds averaged um, Navier-Stokes equation. So um, this here um, denotes time averaging. So the next thing um, would be that we, um, that we introduce another quantity, namely the shear velocity. And in order to do this, I need um, a, a sketch, a little drawing. So like this one here. And so the idea of this Reynolds averaging um, also allows us to speak about a wind profile such that we um, decompose um, the, um, yeah, so the, this, the layer uh, or the atmosphere, that we decompose it in different layers. And um, now the question is how um, will uh, the, the layers affect each, uh, each other? Right? So, and you see here two layers, namely this green layer, a little bit higher. So this green layer here and this blue layer. And um, now if this green layer um, has a velocity that's larger than this velocity, which is, um, yeah, which is um, to expect because if this is at higher, um, at, at a greater height, 
then uh, we know that wind speed increases, right? And it's clear that these two layers, that they should influence each other. How do they influence each other? Well, you may know um, the, um, um, uh, the, the Poisson um, limit for, for laminar flow. This is different here. Yeah, so here the influence of these two layers is via the turbulence. Yeah, so that um, air flows up and uh, air goes down, air parcels, and uh, this is how, um, how both layers will affect each other. So um, let's write that down. So we consider the boundary layer between this blue and, uh, and green um, layer here. So we consider the boundary layer between two media. Um, and both move with respect to each other. Yeah, and they move uh, in x and y direction. So um, this is this coordinate system. Right, uh, they move in x, y direction with respect to each other. Um, of course, without any restrictions to generality, we can assume that uh, the direction in which uh, this moves is the x direction. So this we will uh, do later, but uh, um, according to this figure, it can move in an x and in y direction, and these are the respective velocities. Right, uh, and this velocity here, this is, um, well, this is the exchange of air parcels, uh, turbulent exchange of air parcels uh, that leads actually to this kind of friction between both layers. So, um, both move with respect to each other. and the respective velocity components are u and v. Are u and, and v. Yeah? And now, uh, if there's friction between both, then, of course, there's shear stress and uh, we denote the shear stress, yeah, so uh, has units of Newton per square meter. We denote it by tau. In case there is friction between both media, there will be shear stress. And the respective vector is this tau here, yeah? so shown in red. Yeah. Um, once again, uh, for the turbulent case, and remember, we, um, we discussed at some point the Reynolds number. And um, we s uh, I explained that the Reynolds number, which is a dimensionless quantity, um, that this number um, predicts whether one has laminar or turbulent flow. And uh, what we saw was that the Reynolds number for um, the things that we are concerned with is always beyond the limit or almost, almost uh, beyond the limit where one has to expect turbulent flow. So we can safely assume that we have turbulent flow. 
So for the turbulent case, um, friction is mostly due to transport uh, between the media. So the next thing that we um, introduce is the shear velocity, um, which is also known as friction velocity. It's a little bit, um, well, a little bit more abstract, I, I have to say. Um, and we will just introduce this, um, this quantity here um, and um, we'll get a better idea uh, a few points later. So we introduce the shear velocity and it's called U star, yeah, also known as friction velocity. And um, this is a measure on how strong the friction, so the shear stress between these two media are. For the shear stress um, that a layer of one medium Um, exerts on the other. On a neighboring layer yeah and also this um, shear velocity is used to, to make the Reynolds, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations dimensionless. This is generally, so when you have to deal with differential equations, um, then it's generally a good strategy to try to make them dimensionless. And in doing so, um, such quantities as the Reynolds number, um, well, naturally um, come out. So, now, the next thing is that we um, do some heuristics. Yeah, so, we, um, the next thing that we want to do is that we estimate the, um, the shear stress, so this quantity tau, right? Um, and, well, it's pretty obvious. So, we said that the shear stress comes from transport between the two layers. And, um, of course, this transport is kind of measured by these fluctuations on the one hand side. Um, on the other hand, it's also clear that the more dense this medium is, the more mass is exchanged and accordingly also the shear stress um, should be higher. So, um, therefore, um, we make the following, well, um, ansatz. So the relation that tau is equal to the density of the air, in our case, times the fluctuations in x and y direction. Um, so that uh, we have this, um, yeah, so this relationship here. Yeah, so let's call this equation one. So this is a reasonable, um, a reasonable relation, yeah, um, because, as I said, um, it is turbulent motion. 
um, or transport in um, mostly in that direction that causes uh, the shear stress. It's turbulent motion that causes um, shear stress. So the next thing is um, that we now really um, define um, the shear velocity that we um, already introduced here and um, get um, a relation for that. So the shear velocity is just this product here. Yeah? So the shear velocity The shear velocity is defined as, well, the square of the shear velocity, I should say, um, as the fluctuations of u and w, right? So once again, um, I forgot to mention this um, or to, to emphasize this. So, as I said, we assume without loss of generality um, that we, uh, that our uh, velocity, so with which these two layers uh, move with respect to each other, um, that this is in x direction, right? And what we now have is here uh, the fluctuations in uh, u direction, so in this, uh, in x direction, and the fluctuations in uh, perpendicular to that. Right? So these are the few, uh, these are the two um, fluctuations that uh, remain um, after orienting our coordinate system such that the x-axis goes in the direction of the wind. So this is the definition of the, um, um, of the shear velocity and you see that it's indeed true uh, that the shear velocity is a measure of the shear stress um, so we have the square here, right? Um, but uh, in general, um, yeah, so this here just says the same thing as uh, what we said above. So now we have to make some, um, some assumptions about, um, um, about, the, um, about, the, uh, about these fluctuations. And the assumption is the following. Um, so we say, uh, or we, we guess actually, that the fluctuations are the larger, the bigger the, um, the velocity difference between the two, uh, be between the two layers, right? So this is, a reasonable, um, this is a reasonable assumption, right? And um, the functional dependence is probably complicated, but of course we can always say, uh, we make uh, we take the lowest order of a power series expansion, and this is what we are basically doing. So the fluctuations delta u and delta w. Um, are expected to be the larger the larger the velocity gradient so the larger the difference of the velocities of neighboring layers. Yeah. In other words, um, the larger the gradient. So this here. Yeah. And then we can we can write 
delta u is equal to LU times now this gradient and the same thing here for delta w just with a different proportionality constant LW now. So these are the equations 3a and 3b. And now if you look at, um, at what we wrote, then you see that, um, that these two proportionality constants, that, um, that they have the lengths of, uh, that they have the dimension of a length. And um, yeah, and um, it's kind of a char characteristic length over which uh, this transport between, so this exchange of, of air masses between these layers takes place. So we also um, write this up here. So LU and LW are of unit lengths. Um, and for a given velocity profile, for a given velocity profile, it is clear that the larger this length is, the larger is the, are these fluctuations. So for a given um, profile here, the larger delta u, or the larger, of course, delta w, the longer will be the distance over which the layers interact. Yeah? And uh, this is the reason why one calls these uh, the mixing lengths. Yeah? So the larger delta u or delta w, um, the longer the distance over which the layers interact. Well, uh, what I mean is that you, um, that, you, um, that you induce some turbulence or some uh, exchange between these two layers at say position x equals to zero, and then typically after the uh, position x equal to LW or LU, um, this um, um, this disturbance will um, will have de uh, will have decayed. Yeah, um, but of course, in between, all kinds of new uh, t um, disturbances may may happen. But this doesn't change anything to this um, to this consideration. So the larger delta u or delta w, the longer the distance over which the layers interact. And this gives rise to calling these two lengths uh, mixing lengths. They are referred to as mixing lengths. So Mischungsweglängen in German. So um, if we now look at, um, at, at a greater altitude, uh, the air is less turbulent yeah, because uh, uh, disturbances from the, um, uh, from the surface of, uh, of Earth um, are, well, have decayed uh, partially. And uh, this means that the mixing lengths there are, um, uh, would be longer there. And so what we expect is that uh, the higher we go, the longer will be the, um, uh, the mixing lengths. Yeah? And this, um, again, gives rise to, to an ansatz. 
Yeah, so we have two quantities now, uh, namely LU and LW. And we know that as we go higher, um, so this, uh, they, should, uh, they should get, um, yeah, so this should get um, uh, smaller, uh, 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 larger. And uh, therefore, just because of uh, dimensionality considerations, we would say that their product and the square root of that, that this should be proportional to z. Yeah? So you see, this, there's a lot of heuristics in that. Yeah? So this is, uh, yeah, so Prandtl uh, was a very uh, clever physicist. Um, and without knowing much, um, he, um, well, he derived this logarithmic wind profile. Uh, so there's quite a bit of uh, genius in this, uh, in this derivation. So at greater altitude, air is less turbulent. And this means that the mixing lengths are larger. Yeah. And the simplest ansatz, the simplest reasonable ansatz is that the square root of LU times LW is proportional to, to Z. And uh, this kappa turns out, or this kappa is the von Karman constant. And it is roughly 0.4. But uh, actually, this constant is not uh, important for our uh, further considerations. Yeah. Okay, the simplest ansatz is, yeah, so the simplest ansatz, perhaps I should have written um, with correct dimensionality. Is, is this one here. Yeah? So now what we do is that we substitute this, uh, that we substitute equation um, three in equation two. So what we do is three in two, so this equation, this equation uh, three in two, and then uh, we'll substitute into, uh, this into four. So if we do this, then we get that the square root of this, um, um, no, no, I forgot the name, actually, um, the shear velocity, yeah? The square root of the shear velocity is LU times LW. And uh, now we have the square root, uh, the square of the velocity profile. Equation five. Right? And from this we see that you star squared shear velocity. Well is that this here? So if we take the square root then we get of course um, this expression here. Yeah, and now we use, of course, equation four. Um, and uh, then we see that the velocity profile, yeah, so, uh, the derivative of uh, the velocity, that this is equal to, um, to u star divided by kappa uh, times z. So this is a nice differential equation that can immediately be solved. And you see, of course, that, they are, um, that the logarithm is already here um, apparent, at least if we assume that the shear velocity is independent 
of, um, uh, of Z, of the height, of the altitude. Um, well, uh, why is this so? Well, at least it is a reasonable assumption. If you don't know better, uh, of course it is not completely uh, independent of Z, uh, and therefore the logarithmic wind profile is only an approximation. Um, but still, yeah, so if you don't have um, any more information, then this is the most reasonable assumption. And it, don't, it turns out to be successful. So, assuming that the shear velocity is not dependent on Z, right, indicated in this way, um, this differential equation 6 can be integrated. And what we get is for the average velocity, we get u star, the shear velocity divided by kappa, times the log of z over some reference height, z null, z zero. Yeah. And in this, uh, as it is written here, uh, it means actually that um, at uh, z equal to z zero, the wind speed is zero. Yeah, where the wind speed at height z equal to z zero is zero. Yeah, so this defines this integration constant. Yeah. And uh, now uh, one additional remark to this shear velocity. Um, it turns actually out that it's more or less constant. Yeah? So it uh, decreases only by a few percent in the lowest 100 meters of the atmosphere. So the assumption U star is constant, turns out to be correct. U star decreases um, only by a few percent in the lowest 100 meters of the atmospheric boundary layer. Yeah, roughly 100 meters of the atmospheric boundary layer. Yeah, and this layer, so the lowest 100 uh, meters, this is referred to as the Prandtl layer. Yeah, so this layer is called Prandtl layer. Yeah, he derived the log wind profile for the first time. Of course, it was known before from wind measurements that there is such a behavior. Um, in this simple form, this logarithmic wind profile is only valid for, um, for neutral stability. What is meant by neutral stability? Um, a few slides on that. Um, so, usually, so usually the atmosphere So usually the atmosphere, um, we have higher temperatures on ground, close to ground, and uh, then in the troposphere, uh, the temperature decreases um, with increasing altitude. And uh, so uh, we all know that 
warm air is uh, less dense than cold air, so you might assume that this is not stable. Well, um, the other uh, fact that one also should consider is that uh, the pressure close to, uh, to the surface is, uh, is higher, and therefore the air, even if it, if it is warmer, um, may be equally dense. Right? And if you do the calculations, or if you take the, um, um, the equations from an ideal gas, then you can derive uh, what is a stable um, temperature profile. Yeah? And this would uh, be the neutral case. Right? Um, on the other hand, if you have, um, um, if you, if you have um, a special weather condition where Due to uh, well, due to the weather conditions, the uh, the air close to the surface is colder than uh, than at higher altitudes. Then um, you have more stability, actually, right? And of course, there is also the opposite um, uh, the opposite uh, case, and um, yeah, and there are correction to this logarith uh, logarithmic wind uh, profile. Um, if the conditions are, um, are not um, neutral stability. So here is, uh, so this view graph here shows uh, an example um, of, um, of what's called inversion. Yeah, so inversion means that the temperature profile is inverted. So usually, as I said, and as everybody knows, the temperature close to the surface uh, of Earth is higher than at higher altitudes. However, if you have snow and little uh, wind exchange and, uh, and so on and so, far, uh, and, and so forth, uh, it is possible that warm air um, is, um, flows over the cold air close to ground, and then uh, you have additional stability. Right? And this is shown here, where up here, uh, the air is obviously warmer, and down here it's colder. And now you see very nicely, so this, uh, this smoke here um, doesn't go up here, yeah? but instead it is caught here in the lower layer. And this can of, be, can of course uh, be an unfortunate um, situation for people who live uh, here. Um, in London in the 50s, this happened once uh, and caused many, um, many deaths. Um, and uh, the only solution to that is, of course, that you get uh, um, uh, a different weather situation with wind that blows out um, uh, the cold air here, uh, down here. A very impressive picture uh, I also found, I guess, on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on, on first glance, I didn't even see this. Uh, what's what's there? Uh, where is this actually? I forgot. I think it's a Chinese uh, city, right? And so here you have clear skies, right? But below there is all this uh, the smoke here. Okay, so the der derivation uh, that we made here, this logarithmic wind profile, needs some corrections if uh, you have a weather, weather conditions like that or just the opposite of that. Good. So, um, in the simple form, so the simple form Um, seven is only valid for neutral stability. A is opposed um, to, for example, um, inversion.
Ja, um, in practice, um, one uses this wind, um, so this logarithmic law in a little bit different way. One actually tries to get rid of the shear velocity, so this u star and the common constant, by just writing this equation here twice for two different lengths. And then, um, of course, yeah, if you divide it through each other, then this here cancels out. And um, then you can uh, say at least um, how the velocity, how the wind speed increases with altitude. So um, a sub-sub-chapter in a certain sense, so the logarithmic wind law in practice how it is actually used so um, for practical use um, the logarithmic wind law is recast in the form Oh, I forgot, yeah, I forgot to show the, uh, the iPad here. Hit the wrong button, sorry for that. So for practical use, the logarithmic wind law is recast in the following form. Namely, that the velocity, I denote it now with V, is equal to some reference velocity times the logarithm of z over z0 divided by um, the same thing at some reference height. Yeah, so, um, So V of, yeah, V of ZR is equal to VR, yeah? So this is the idea. Yeah? And as reference height, for example, the German Weather Service uses 10 meters. Um, and this uh, Z0 now depends on, um, um, on the surface condition. Yeah, so set uh, zero depends on the roughness length or on the surface roughness. Set zero is called roughness length. Or simply surface roughness. And um, I have a few typical values here. So like this here. Yeah. Just copied from, from the all-knowing Wikipedia. Uh, at least this is what I remember. Yeah. So uh, for OpenSea, it is very short, uh, less than a millimeter or so. Um, snow with no vege um, vegetation, no obstacles, five millimeters or so, right? And then if you go to city centers with high and low rise buildings, then it can, um, can be two meters or, or so, right? Um, I have another figure here indicating what's, uh, what happens, yeah, so, Um, the, this is how the logarithmic wind profile changes, right? So the, um, on open land uh, or over sea, yeah, so this uh, goes up uh, much more gradually than um, over, um, over city core as, as shown here.
Yeah. Okay, so with this I would um, propose that we make a short break um, of five minutes or so. I prepare, uh, I should have switched on my tea uh, since a while. Um, what we also could do uh, is to uh, is to have a little Zoom meeting uh, in uh, this five minutes break or so. So I would just uh, turn down uh, the tone here and, um, and switch on um, a Zoom meeting. So if you want to join me in these five minutes, please do so.
So, da sind wir wieder. Ich hoffe, dass der Ton immer noch funktioniert. Machen wir ein bisschen weiter. Und zwar, das Nächste, was ich betrachten möchte, ist, wie die Verteilung, wie die statistische Verteilung des, der Windgeschwindigkeit ist. Wir wissen ja alle, der Wind bläst mal stärker, mal schwächer und so weiter. Und, ähm, naja, das Erste, was man annehmen würde, wenn man da irgendeine Verteilungsfunktion finden soll, wäre wahrscheinlich, dass man eine Gauss-Funktion annimmt. Aber das kann ja wohl nicht sein, nicht? denn so eine Gauss-Funktion, die, ähm, die, die ist ja symmetrisch ja? und wir wissen ja, dass, ähm, dass der Wind ja, schwächer als Nullgeschwindigkeit kann er nicht haben ja? und die Gauss-Funktion hätte dann Ausläufe. Ja? Das nächste wäre, dass man eine Rayleigh-Verteilung ähm, annimmt. Ähm, auch das passt nicht so richtig. Und äh, man verwendet schließlich eine Verteilung, die Sie wahrscheinlich äh, noch nicht gehört haben, nämlich die Weibull-Verteilung. Und hier haben Sie den Herrn Weibull. Hier haben Sie den Herrn Weibull. Ein, äh, ich glaube, ein schwedischer oder norwegischer. Mathematiker und der hat eben diese Weibull-Verteilung, naja, nicht erfunden, da waren zwei andere vorhin schon, äh, schon da, aber er hat es wahrscheinlich mathematisch richtig ausgearbeitet oder einfach eben Glück gehabt, dass es nach ihm benannt worden ist und nach, nicht nach den ersten, die diese Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung ähm, ähm, ja, erfunden haben. Ähm, Weibull-Verteilungen, die verwendet man insbesondere dann, wenn, ähm, wenn man mit Situationen zu tun hat, äh, zum Beispiel äh, in, der, in der Materialprüfung, ja? also typisches Beispiel, ähm, wenn, ein, eine Kette, wenn Sie eine Kette haben und fragen, wann die kaputt geht, dann ist natürlich klar, dass so eine Kette kaputt geht, wenn ein einzelnes Glied kaputt geht. Oder wenn Sie, ein äh, oh, I'm speaking in German, I should switch, uh, switch to English, um, okay, uh, I have to start, uh, start over, I'm sorry. Why didn't anybody protest that I'm suddenly <laughs> speaking in German? Uh, so, the Weibull distribution. We will use the Weibull distribution in order to describe the distribution of wind speeds. And uh, the Weibull distribution has been introduced in order to describe phenomena where some part fails due to the failure of a single, of a small uh, element of, um, of that part. I mentioned a chain, uh, which is of course broken if uh, a single chain link is broken, or if you have um, um, a beam of metal, right, um, then it can break if there's a crack in a, in a very small, uh, yeah, so at a, at a certain location of this, um, of this blade. Yeah, and uh, such um, failure mechanisms can be described by the Weibull um, uh, distribution. Okay, so this will be the next chapter here, the next subchapter, uh, at which number are we? 5.6, and I should switch to the iPad. 5.6, um, a probability distribution um, for the wind speed. So the standard the standard is to use the Weibull distribution.
and I'll give the mathematical formula for that. Yeah? So what we would have here is, yeah, so this is the, um, the probability density. So the d density at a certain velocity that this is given by some parameter k divided by another parameter a times now the velocity divided by a and then again k as a parameter as an exponent here k minus 1 and then an exponential function where we have b over a to the k's power. Uh, so let's give this the number, the number, so at which, say 10, yeah? Um, well, um, now we can look at a few examples and how this looks uh, for different, uh, for different K's and A's. Ah, well, perhaps we look at, uh, we look at uh, first at special cases um, such that, uh, um, that the figure becomes more clear. Yeah, so um, where K defines the shape of the distribution. And A is more or less the expectation value. Now, to be precise, the expect expectation value is given by, um, by A times the gamma function of 1 plus 1 divided by k. Yeah, so, um, in fact, the expectation value is a times the gamma function of 1 plus 1 over k. Yeah. And it will turn out that uh, we need um, k's ranging from um, a little bit less than 2 or so, perhaps 1, um, to 5, 6 or so, right? And you see that then we have uh, the gamma function uh, of 1, which is close to, um, which is close to 1. So um, if we now, so we say here or we claim here that K defines the shape of the distribution and uh, this you can already see if you look at a few special cases, uh, the first would be uh, K equal to 1. Then of course uh, we have here the zero's power, yeah? so then this here is 1 and then we ha simply have an exponential. Yeah, so this is an exponential distribution. Um, if we have k equal to 2, um, then it's the Rayleigh distribution. And for k equal to or approximately equal to 3.602, we have a distribution with no skewness as yeah, so a symmetric distribution, similar to a, to a Gaussian distribution. Skewness. So, and now let's look at, um, at this function. Yeah, here, yeah. So here you see the viable distribution for a few examples. Yeah, so instead of A, they use actually here lambda, uh, but actually lambda 
uh, would be 1 over a, but this makes no difference because they choose here lambda equal to 1. Yeah, so um, think lambda being a. And then you see um, we have here uh, the orange curve. This is an exponential curve. Right, and you see the bigger k is made, uh, yeah, so the closer it looks to, um, uh, to a normal distribution, well, uh, actually, yeah, uh, not quite right. So this is actually, um, yeah, so this is steeper here on the, on the right-hand side already. Um, yeah, so for 3.6 or so, uh, it would be symmetric. And um, the other important case is here the Rayleigh distribution for, um, well, uh, it's actually not exactly here. Uh, so it's 1.5, not exactly the Rayleigh distribution. Okay, well, um, now we can use, so now the idea is that, um, that the wind speed distribution can be described by curves like this. And it depends very much on where you are, which curve you would use. Two extreme cases. So in the trade wind regions, Passat wind regionen, there you have a pretty steady wind. So you would, uh, so you would expect to find a distribution like this one here, right? Where you have most of the time, wind at a certain wind speed. The other extreme is the Arctic region. There we have the, um, the Arctic vortex, and so there's a lot of time uh, the wind speed is, is zero. Yeah? So there's no wind, and this would then pretty much, yeah, so this would be described uh, more or less by well, by a small k parameter. And in our region, so in the temperate region, so Central Europe or so, um, the k parameter is on the order of two. So um, for our, for the circumstances here, the Rayleigh distribution would be a pretty good um, approximation. But um, what you also see is at this figure here, um, is that the distribution um, or this shape here, so the k parameter, that this here changes with height. Yeah, so what is shown here is the k parameter. Um, and what you see is that, um, well, that close to the ground, uh, the wind speed is low, right, most of the time. Yeah, so this is what you see here. Yeah, so you see also the average wind speed. Right, uh, and then as you go up, the wind gets more steady. This is used by children when they fly their dragon in, in fall. Right, so wind is more steady. Um, and, um, and then if you go to bigger heights, uh, it reverses actually. I'll show more of these curves in a minute. Uh, and the other thing is of course that wind speed increases uh, with height. Yeah, so the average, so the expectation value increases with height. People um, planning wind farms actually invest quite some work in finding out the Weibull uh, parameters for, um, for their regions, so where this windmill is going to be installed or even a wind farm. And uh, here is one example that I found in the literature um, here for the Arabic uh, Gulf. Uh, and what you see here in color coding are the white bull scale parameter here and the shape parameter. Yeah, so the scale parameter, this is what we called A. And um, the, the shape uh, parameter, this is our K, also called here K. Right, and the shape parameter has units of meters per second of wind speed, whereas the K parameter is dimensionless. And you see, uh, well, here in these red regions, you would have an expectation value for the wind speed on the order of eight or nine meters per second, which is pretty, uh, a pretty decent wind and quite a good potential for installing, um, 
for installing um, uh, wind turbines. The same thing for, um, from the Dutch Royal Meteorologic Service or something like that. Um, so um, you find um, a similar curve uh, than I have shown um, here uh, before. So for this location, onshore. Right? So you see the logarithmic wind profile. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you could say this is the A parameter or you, uh, as a function of height, which has to reproduce the logarithmic wind profile. And you see it's very well reproduced. What are the different colors? The different colors uh, refer to different seasons. Yeah, so the black one is the average over the entire year. This one here, if I see it correctly. And then we have December, January, February. This is this red curve. So this one here. All right, so uh, there's not so much wind here. Uh, and then we have January, uh, what is this? July, uh, June, July, August uh, is the other extreme here. All right. Uh, well, uh, actually, I said it uh, wrong. Yeah, so here we have high wind speeds, obviously, and here we have low wind speeds. Um, and then the Weibull parameter. Yeah, so as you go um, to a certain height, uh, 100 meters or so, wind is fairly, uh, fairly steady. Yeah, uh, lower to the ground, it's less steady, and at higher heights, here's 600 meters, uh, it's, it's also less. Um, on C, yeah, so another example from the same data set, um, you see that this is here much more steep. Yeah? Um, and um, the shape doesn't depend so much on, on height here. As yeah? so we see pretty, uh, indicated, uh, so this maximum here, um, uh, resembles a little bit this curve here, but it's barely visible here. Yeah, so the uh, the wind, uh, so the shape of the distribution is fairly uh, fairly constant, and you also see that it's around two here. Right, so pretty much a Rayleigh distribution, yeah, and you see that people measure this with uh, with quite some um, with, with quite some effort, effort in order to be able to predict the yield. So what else do I have in this chapter? I guess we are done. Yeah, we are done actually. And we would come to the next chapter, um, which is kind of my favorite chapter, I have to say, um, because this chapter is on the design and also on the ultimate limits of, um, um, of windmills. So this is... Um, Chapter six, and the headline is the theory of ideal wind turbines. Uh, we'll just um, start it um, and provide one fundamental insight that on first glance is a little bit surprising, but just a little bit surprising. So chapter six, the theory of ideal wind turbines. Yeah? And the first thing that we look at would be the power that is actually carried by wind. How much power is in the wind? This would be the first um, subject that we look at. 6.1, the power the power carried by wind. Well, what we do is, that we look at a cylinder of, of wind, like this. Like this. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so we have a cylinder of wind that blows in, say, in this direction, right? a stream of, of air, and we look for the kinetic energy. Right? And the kinetic energy is, of course, given by 1 half mv squared, school knowledge. So the kinetic energy of a mass m moving with velocity v is given by E equals one half m v squared. Yeah? And the mass is, of course, well, the, the, the mass of wind that is going through this, um, through this control layer somehow. Yeah? So we measure how much mass goes through this. But with this, you already see that the faster wind blows, the more mass goes through it, right? So you see that the mass here depends actually also on wind, uh, 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 on the wind speed, right? Okay. So let's write that down. Um, for um, the case of continuous media, now here of course air, the moving mass is the air mass streaming through A. through this control area A. Yeah? So what we assume are, of course, stationary conditions. So now we calculate the air mass. Yeah? Um, the air mass streaming through A per time element, per infinitesimal time, dt, um, is given, so then an infinitesimal mass, so is given by dm is equal to rho times the infinitesimal volume and this is, of course, given by rho times this area A times dx. Now we divide the entire thing through 1 over dt, and then we get the derivative, the temporal derivative of the mass is equal to rho times A times V. Yeah? So now, instead of speaking of the kinetic energy, uh, you see it makes sense to speak about the power. So what we basically do is, or what we actually do is, that we take the derivative here of this equation. Well, why don't I call it 1? Yeah, so we take the derivative of this equation 1, and uh, then you see that uh, we said that we have stationary conditions so that this velocity does not depend on time. But we saw that this here, you know, so th if I take the derivative of that, then I have the power here. Well, uh, this is constant, but the derivative of m, we saw that this is not equal to zero, uh, but it's given by rho times a times v. So, um, taking the derivative 
of equation one and considering um, V is constant because stationary, um, we find Um, we find that the power carried by wind is one over uh, is one uh, over two zero point five times m dot the derivative of the mass times v squared and now if we substitute equation two then we find that we have one half rho times a times v to the third power to the third power. Yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, we have a cubic dependence of the power carried by wind on the wind speed. Yeah? This, uh, this is promising on the one hand side, but it's a curse on the other hand uh, too. Right? So it's promising because by just going a little bit higher, and so we have learned from the logarithmic wind uh, profile that if you go a little bit higher, then, um, then the, the wind speed increases and uh, you see that the power contained in the wind goes up with the third power of that. Yeah? Um, so uh, promising, yeah? building a little bit higher windmills uh, is a good idea. Um, on the other hand, referring to the K parameter, if you have unsteady winds, then this means that the fluctuations that you get, yeah, so if you produce electricity, uh, which is of course proportional, um, so the electrical power will be proportional to the wind power, uh, you see that you also have huge fluctuations uh, in the electricity. And in addition, we'll see that the mechanical stress on a windmill goes up also with yeah, a certain power, so we'll see what it is, um, um, of the windmill. Yeah, you, you even see that if you have a huge diameter of the windmill, then of course the wind speed um, at, the, at the tip is a very, can be a very different one from from uh, the lower tip, right? And so there is a permanently changing uh, load on the, uh, on the rotor blades, even if the wind speed um, does not change, yeah? so in time, but of course it changes in, uh, as a function of altitude. So um, let's, uh, as a final uh, thing to do for today, Let's make this remark. Um, the cubic dependence of wind power on the wind speed is promising and occurs at the same time. Yeah. So the positive side is build a little bit higher tower And um, render an uneconomic side into an economic one. 
into a profitable one. Yeah. And the other thing is, oh, well, this is a disadvantage. Um, for unsteady wind, Um, there will be a um, very unsteady electricity production. There will be very unsteady electricity production. Um, and then uh, the final thing is uh, negative implications um, for yeah um, for the construction. of the entire wind power plant. Yeah, so with this, I would like to conclude for today. Um, next time, we'll continue um, by deriving the so-called Betz limit, a very famous law for, for wind power. Um, similarly important, yeah, for, 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 uh, for wind power, uh, then, then the Carnot limit for, um, for, for heat engines. Right? So this gives, um, 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 yeah, so this is kind of the, of the benchmark for, uh, for designing a windmill. And you'll see that uh, this will be a nice uh, derivation, quite simple actually, um, and uh, yeah, look forward to the next uh, lecture. And we'll actually use this uh, this Betz law uh, in order to also find out on how um, the rotor blades, on how the geometry of the rotor blades should be designed. Yeah, and with this, thank you for your atten uh, attention. See you next uh, Tuesday. If you wish, I'll open uh, the Zoom meeting. Uh, we can chat for five minutes or 10 minutes, or if you have more questions, then we can also chat for a longer time will take me uh, 10 minutes or so until I, I have switched everything off here. Yeah, have a good evening. Thank you.